We're going to fire up the laptop, we'll arm the ignition on the car, so you floor it. And then... You're watching Motoring Box, proudly supported by Century Batteries. We're back with our old friend, the BA Falcon XR6 Turbo. As I promised in the last video, I'm going to give you a bit of an update as to how this car is going. Uh, it has been just over two and a half years since Hoff tuned this thing back in the day. Although it was okay on the dyno, on the street it was a very different situation. If you were on the highway, for example, in fourth gear, and you loaded this thing up, you, you almost went full throttle with it, the boost would just climb to the moon. It would go to like 20, 22 pound, I think was the cutoff. Uh, you're running higher boost, you especially run an aftermarket dump pipe, which is what I've got here, I've got a four inch one. Uh, yeah, these things can no longer control boost with the stock setup, like the stock uh, boost controller and also the, the particular the wastegate flapper is too small to flow. Any meaningful amount of uh, exhaust gas from around the turbine, it spools up way too hard, you get too much boost, you can't control it. So, good news is the turbo that we dropped in about a year ago with the rebuilt core, the bigger rehousing with the bigger flapper on it, has done a great job uh, at controlling it. But that was just half of the story, but I'll get back to that in a second. I also had issues with cold starting this car because when you take your car to a tuner, it's already, the engine's already hot, you know, and they're tuning it for a, a hot tune, for a power tune. But there's a lot that goes into driving a car. And in particular, it's how it goes when you start it cold. How does the throttle respond? Uh, at sort of low speed cruising conditions, stop start traffic, yeah, especially when it's cold, is a big deal. So I had huge issues starting this car initially. Uh, it was starting really rich. It was blowing black smoke. You would even see black splatter on the ground behind the car as it was idling from a cold start. So it was not ideal. So I, I sort of got in touch with Hoff and he's like, yeah, we'll need to do a cold start tune. Um, he could have dialed in to do it, but I knew he was a busy man and I wanted to learn a little bit about NSP. So that's the, the Haltech tuning software. So I thought, no, we're going to fix it. And over the last two years or so, that's exactly what I've done. It's taken time because when you're doing it by yourself, uh, every time you do a cold start, it gives you a chance to sort of load the laptop up, change some settings and see if it's any better the next time you start the car up. So that is exactly what I've done. And the awesome thing is when you start this car now, even in winter like it is now, on a cold morning, you know, five degrees or less. Beautiful, perfect. So what we're gonna do in this video is we're gonna jump in the car, I'm gonna fire up the laptop, I'll record the screen, and I'll show you what I've learned about the Haltech NSP software. And uh, apologies, yes, this will be a little bit technical, uh, as far as I can, uh, to the extent of my knowledge, but this might help some of you who have Barra-powered Falcons with a Haltech and you wanna learn a little bit more about it, this could potentially help you out. So we're gonna fire up the laptop, We'll arm the ignition on the car, and you'll see NSP is already loading up the tune on this car. I'm going to hide the base fuel tuning figure because that's all of Hoff's work. Um, but if I jump into the fuel coolant temperature correction, this is really, when I was talking about the cold start issues, this was the map that controlled all of that. So when a car starts from cold, it needs more fuel because it's not running as efficiently when the engine is cold versus when it's hot. So you can see here on the map, for example, when you're idling, which is around probably negative 14 pounds, uh, and it's about 10 degrees, it is adding a certain amount more fuel into the car. And when the engine's cold, if you wanna know if these figures are on the ball or not, you start the engine. And you have a look at this uh, short-term fuel trim up the top here. So we'll just wait for the car to go through its post-start corrections. You can see we're in the base fuel tuning map here at the moment. The car is idling around this cell here, so about negative 10 pound um, at about 750 RPM. And you can see uh, on this cell here, um, we've got a reading of you know 53.8. This is like the fuel load per RPM per cylinder pressure or, or boost pressure, I should say. Um, we are currently at 3% trim, which means that figure in that cell is about 3% too low. Uh, it's adding about 2.8%, 2.7% more petrol uh, to get the air fuel ratio perfect. In a perfect world, you would have this map so dialed in that that short term fuel trim figure over here would be zero. But I don't think you can ever get that far or that close to it. So long as you're within a couple of percent, it seems to be absolutely fine. 
Um, but you can see here, uh, I've got a couple of things in my favorite list here. Uh, you've got a fuel coolant temperature correction. This is what I was playing around with back in the day when I was having that, that really rich running engine on a cold start. I essentially selected this whole table and applied by pressing P, a percentage change. So it was way too rich. I did like a negative 50 reduction and you know was, went sort of up and down with it to see how I could, how close I could get it to that sort of 0% short term fuel trim because it's trimming even when it's cold. So yes, that is something that I played around with for a few weeks and that ironed out the cold starting issues. And that's the really interesting thing about it. When you learn the NSP software like I've done over the past year or so, you're not at the mercy of the tuner anymore because you're taking your car to a tuner for, it's gonna be hot, you know, they're doing a hot power run tune uh, to get the car running perfectly when it's hot, which is awesome. But yes, when it's cold, it's a different story. This thing was an angry, angry car when it was cold. The fuel temp correction was one issue, but we also had um, transient throttle issues too, which is uh, another setting in NSP, which calculates when you stab the throttle or, or apply a certain percentage in a certain time of throttle, it would add in some extra fuel just to make sure that the car didn't lean out for a split second. Uh, I could never get that set right either. Uh, and that just meant that uh, when you sort of floored this thing, it would always have a, a couple of seconds of hesitation as it bogged down before it took off. And you can actually see that in the dyno video back in the day, when Hoff starts the power run, you can sort of hear the car kind of go, and then it takes off. Have a listen. So even back then, we were suffering from transient throttle issues. Uh, Hoff didn't really know. Um, I just told him I applied a base tune. He probably didn't have any reason to doubt the transient throttle settings, so uh, he didn't actually touch them. So yeah, this car did have issues sort of on throttle. So as you can see, now that the car's been idling for a while, that short-term fuel trim is all the way down. Uh, the cool thing about that short-term fuel trim as well is you can take those changes that the car is performing on the fly at any given revs or, or RPM or like boost um, intake manifold pressure and it can apply them to a long-term fuel trim table to apply the learnings that it's found out in any given situation so that it can apply them automatically moving forward. So if you have a look in here under my favorite uh, long-term fuel trim you can adjust the gain so I've set this so that from fairly low RPMs and, and up to sort of zero pounds of manifold pressure, uh, that it's, its learnings are pretty slow. This is a, a figure from one to, I think it's a hundred. Yes, one to a hundred. One being the slowest, a hundred being the fastest. So up to sort of 1500 RPM, zero uh, pounds of manifold pressure, the learnings are fairly slow, but then it ramps up from there as you go into higher boost and also higher RPM the learnings are faster. So you can have a look here on the base fuel trim. This is the long-term learning where it's applied it. So most of them are zero, which is awesome. It means it's happy at that given RPM pressure uh, range in the table. But in particular, you can see down here uh, around the sort of 1500 to 3500 when you're really sort of idling or off throttle uh, or like cruise, which is probably around here. It's really taking about 10% fuel out of some of these cells. I'm not really sure why that is. The car is running very nicely, so I'm just gonna let it continue to learn long-term like it's been doing. Uh, you can see if I raise the throttle here into this sort of negative 9.6 zone, it's even still taking out a bit more, so uh, there must be some additional learning which needs to happen. But the car is very happy, very happy with how it's running at the moment. So yes, the long-term fuel trim is something that's pretty cool. You've got to remember as well, we've replaced the turbo in this car, uh, the, um, the turbine, like the core of the turbo, I should say, uh, to a more modern design. And that's probably going to have different characteristics compared to the stock standard one from 20 plus years ago. Uh, some of these sort of RPM and, and load cells are changing based on what we've done to the car. So that's kind of the cool thing. You know, I was able to drop in that turbo, I had a few people in the comments saying, you need to go and get it retuned again. Not really, I can do it myself and so can the Haltech. Together, we're a pretty good team. And yes, when that turbo was changed, uh, I was able to then install a Mac valve and finally get some proper boost control. So if we go in here to the boost control tab, we have um, the settings here. A Mac valve needs a 33 Hertz um, 
output frequency to operate and basically bleed air and allow the wastegate to then open uh, to control the boost pressure, I suppose. That's what they do. Um, so I was able to set that all up, you know, do all the wiring myself. Uh, and also when I changed that turbocharger, I also had issues with the boost was still spiking, right? You would floor it, the revs and the boost, I guess, would go up to sort of 20 pounds and then you would see it drop down to my um, target pressure, which I think was 15 at the time. So it was kind of over boosting and then it would come back. And it's like, well, why is that? Uh, you can set um, a duty cycle. So I don't know the, uh, the specifics behind this table, but it dictates, you know, how much of the time the boost controller is operating because it can operate even before it's hit, you know, your target boost pressure. And uh, I found out if I lowered all of the figures in this table, the boost came on a bit more gently. And it also meant that it was hitting, you know, that 15 pound target pressure, bang on, nice and smoothly and not going beyond it, more importantly. So um, I will leave some people in the comments to explain what this table actually does. And that kind of works in conjunction, again, with your target pressure, but also uh, your control point offset. If you're at a given RPM and a given uh, boost range, I suppose, uh, if your target boost was, say, 15 pound, you can control uh, from this setting here how early before that the boost controller starts working. So I've got it set to five. So when at that point it got to 10 pound as you're speeding up, that's when this duty cycle table kicks in and you would be, what, about 10 uh, pound at 4,000 RPM. It'll start cycling that boost controller, letting a bit of air through to sort of get the wastegate cracked open a little bit and just really slow down how fast that boost is flying up. So in conjunction with those two settings, you can sort of dial this down uh, and also increase this um, control point offset to a point where the boost comes up smoothly, hits your mark and stays there. It doesn't go any higher. That's the main thing, especially with this engine. The main issue I had with this car was that the transient throttle, you know, when you're pumping the throttle, it was bogging down. Haltech actually released an update. They've done several over the time that I've owned this ECU, which changes how you interact with it through NSP. And one of them is this map prediction fuel film model. Uh, and that really works out, I believe, uh, the calculation of when the injector sprays fuel, how much of it is, is atomized into the intake air and then goes into the cylinder. When the engine's cold, more of that fuel actually hits the walls of the intake runner and pulls as a film on that runner before it eventually makes its way into the cylinder. So there's less fuel getting into the cylinder when the engine's cold, uh, initially, I guess. Uh, and that's where this fuel film prediction model comes into play. So the cool thing about it is, is you can just set a few figures and then the car, again, applies its own learning. When you stab the throttle, it has this sort of expected amount of manifold pressure and how much fuel needs to go in for any given manifold pressure, RPM, whatnot. Again, I'm not going to pretend to understand all of it, just that I was able to tweak some of these figures um, and then the car is basically applying this learning by itself, which I think is really cool. And again, this is worlds above the previous setting which I had, which was called transient throttle. That was basically a table of fuel readings where you had to apply how much fuel to put in at any given sort of throttle position, uh, but also how much that throttle uh, is increasing over time, how much fuel goes in. It was a nightmare. I could never get it to work right. This system, really awesome. Almost straight out of the box without changing any settings on it. The car was pretty much 90% happy uh, and it was just changing some of these scaling figures. I think I reduced this um, map transient uh, down a little bit. Again, back in the day, I did research what this meant. I can't remember what it means now. I think I reduced the fuel pooling percentages as well on the basis that the injectors on these engines are fairly close to the valves. They're not too far away, they're, they're right at the end of the runner. Um, and also, I think I reduced the film ev evaporation time constant down a little bit too. Again, I'm not an expert. There'll be a lot of tuners probably in the comments section uh, slamming what I'm doing. But at the end of the day, the car runs awesomely. And uh, yeah, it's actually really responsive now on throttle. Very smooth, especially when you're daily driving a car like this. That matters a lot. So the Haltech has lots of settings in here which you can look at too. So we've got launch control. Uh, you can set 
uh, your RPM for launch control. So I've currently got it set to 2200. This is not something I've played around with a lot. Uh, but when we take this thing to the drags and Willowbank Raceway is actually about to open up again. So hopefully we'll be able to do that in the near future. This will be something that'll be cool to help you on the runs. You know, you could bring the laptop with you and really dial in uh, a good launch control RPM, let the clutch out in the same manner and really try and dial it into a specific RPM to sort of fine tune your launches. So uh, that's something we can have a look at. I'm probably gonna muck it up just because I've not really used it before and um, yeah, it's, it's a pretty crap road surface here as well. But we've got it set to 2200, right? So if we put the clutch in, we're in first gear and we floor it, you've gotta be above, I think I've got it above 75% throttle. So you floor it, and then that was actually pretty good for this road surface. Uh, it didn't bog down at all. It kind of spun the wheels just a fraction, but I think that's really what you want for a launch. I just realized uh, I had um, traction control turned on for that launch, and that's why it did pop around a little bit and it's kind of stutter and I think that was just the uh, the Haltech controlling the um, the traction control I should say. So potentially if you were drag racing in this car you could leave the traction control on and you're using the uh, the launch control to sort of get that launch perfect. Let the traction control deal with the wheel slip and uh, it does so in a way that it's it's probably helping you go faster uh, rather than being a hindrance like the uh, stock standard system tends to, to be. So as you can see, as we're driving here at the moment uh, on my awesome IC7, I can actually see like the short term fuel trim, which is negative 3.7 at the moment. So at this RPM, which is about what, 1750 at uh, about negative five pounds of intake pressure, yeah, it's dialing out about 4%, taking out 4% fuel, I should say. Uh, so that's where this dash has really come into its own as well, is just letting me have a really good overview of what the car's doing. Uh, what it's doing at any given moment, if it's running rough or for any reason, why? Uh, and that is actually something I, I forgot to mention, that is something that has happened uh, since I've owned it the last uh, six months or so. Well, it's been good for about six months, but before then, I would have issues where I'd be driving, it'd run perfectly, and then all of a sudden, it would just run so rich that it'd be coughing black smoke, running like shit, uh, and it would do that for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then it would come good again. I didn't know what was going on. I thought perhaps the O2 sensor was stuffed. Uh, I replaced it, did the same thing. I thought maybe the manifold pressure sensor was stuffed. I replaced it, it did the same thing. Uh, but when I got the IC7 installed, I happened to notice when that issue was happening that uh, my manifold pressure was sort of going, when you'll say cruising, it was at around negative five, negative 10. Uh, I noticed that it was spiking up to zero. So the car was thinking at that time that it had more air in the manifold than it really did. So it was adding more fuel and that's why it was running rich. So what it actually was, and it made sense in the end, was that uh, it was my wiring. If you remember this car had a piggyback ECU, which I took out, I had to fix a whole lot of the wiring, six gear. Uh, it turns out the wire for the, uh, the map sensor the solder hadn't quite taken to the wiring and yeah, it was periodically sort of disconnecting itself, I suppose, from movement. So I was losing signal from the map sensor. The, the car was thinking the manifold pressure was zero when in fact it was less, it was negative, it was like vacuum. It was adding more fuel and it was running terribly. So I ducked in there, I fixed the solder on the wire, sure enough, they basically came apart in my hand when I was looking at it, soldered them back together and it's been running perfectly since. And if there's anyone out there who's interested in getting a Haltech for their Falcon, I would highly recommend it. They are not cheap. Let me just stress that, you know, I know times are tough these days, but if you're looking to modify your car beyond a certain point and you want to be involved with the, the journey of it, you don't just want to be running back to a tuner to change every little thing, get one. They're really good fun. And it just means that, uh, yeah, you're that much more involved with the whole process. And 
I just love this car that little bit more because of that. It's a bit of me in this car. There's a bit of Hoff in there too. We've all been tag teaming it, I suppose. But yeah, it's uh, it's been a fun journey and it's, it's why I'm getting a Haltech for my AU as well. It's just a no brainer for me. There's some people, um, it is a bit off topic, but there are some people who like to convert AU Falcons to a Barra, uh, DCU, PCM. Uh, they also then have to add the Barra throttle body and also the pedal, the accelerator pedal. There's probably, there's obviously the loom and all that needs to come across too, but it is a cheap way to do it, but it's, it's not the way I want to do it. I want to do it closer to what I've got here, and that's why we're running a Haltech. The standalone ones, um, like the, the the Elite 750 is only $1,600, I think. Uh, it's not crazy expensive, like don't get me wrong, it's a, a fair little whack of money there, but it's not really that crazy when you think about it for what it gives you. It's actually, I dare say it, quite good value for money. When you're looking at a Barra standalone like we've got here, it's about 4,000, so that's obviously stepping right up there multiple levels but this thing when you really delve into what it does this thing has way more functions built into it to cater specifically for this car like for b-series fg f-series falcons i should say uh, it handles everything so haltech is of course uh, an australian company they build these ecus in sydney uh, why would you not support a company which is putting out such amazing products. It is truly world class. I, I'm really proud to be running one of their ECUs. Uh, if you're in the position to do the same and you're interested, go ahead and do it. I, You will not regret it. It's one of those things where you pay the money, you do it right, you do it right the first time. And that's something I'm guilty of doing wrongly on other things. The poor man pays twice. Uh, if you pay once, get a Haltech, you'll never look back. So that's it guys, thank you very much for watching. Have a good one, and I'll see you next time.